This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12, CR 1522. The records should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with three of his attorneys, Ms. Nelson, Ms. Spengler, and Ms. Higgs. And the prosecution is represented by Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, and Ms. Stitch McGuire. The record should reflect that we are outside the presence of the jury. I have distributed to the parties uh, the latest draft of the instructions and the uh, verdict forms. <coughs> so let's talk about those first. If we can. Yeah. I would rather talk about the instructions first. So let's talk about the instructions. All right, the, uh, the newest draft reflects some of the changes that I made over the weekend. And so I want to make sure that council have had an opportunity to review those. And if they need more time to review them, then you know I, well, I'll take a break and council can review them further. But let, I think what makes the most sense is to go through them in order. Um, and I'm not going to mention any changes as to form, but only substances. And, and I don't think there were that many changes as to form. But on the first instruction, I made the change that we talked about on page 2. Uh, at the top of the page, Ms. Nelson asked that um, in that last sentence of the first incomplete paragraph that I changed by the end of August to read at the latest at the end of August. And so that change has been made. Do you see that? Okay, Ms. Nelson, do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. And I just wanted to let you know, I made it as far as the instruction on the affirmative defense of insanity before the court took the bench. So okay, that's fine. I haven't fine. had a chance to look at anything beyond that. Okay, that's fine. All right, um, the next one, uh, the next change I made is with respect to the last page of that same instruction. And this one, I made it on my own because I thought it made sense to make it. Um, in the penultimate paragraph on that page, at the end I added a sentence that says, similarly, if I sustain an objection to a question after a witness had already provided an answer or partial answer, you must not consider any part of that answer in your deliberations. Um, that's not in the model instruction, and it wasn't in the draft instruction that we were working with as of Friday. And so I wanted, I thought that it made sense to include that in there. I have instructed the jurors throughout that about this specific point. And I know that uh, there was a point when I felt like uh, Ms. Pengler started asking to strike answers to sustain objections over and over. And I decided to deny the request because I don't think that's, that was, I didn't think it was appropriate. So, but I told the jury, uh, members of the jury, you know that if I sustain an objection, it means that you should disregard any partial answer or full answer provided. And, and so I've been telling, that, telling them that throughout, and I think it makes sense to include that point in these instructions. Is there any objection from the people? No, Your Honor, thank you. Is there any objection from the defense? No. Okay. The next instruction that has a change from Friday's draft is the instruction that starts with, in this case, a separate offense is charged against the defendant in each count. And all I did on this one is I added a comma. Now, I know that's not a substantive change. I'm mentioning it simply because I mentioned it on Friday, and I know that both sides were okay with that because I asked them on Friday, and they told me they had no objection. Uh, the, next, the very next instruction was changed at the people's request without objection to reflect uh, or to make it consistent so as to use culpable uh, mental state, um, and, and that's what it reads now instead of state of mind. And in fact, there was a place, if you see on the third full paragraph. Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't think that 
I think that one has been perhaps been moved to be um, later in the instructions. Is that what? Yeah, you're saying? right. The order has been moved, and I said I would move it. Thank you for reminding me. I moved it to after the elemental instructions, and I said that I would move it, but the changes should have been made. So check that if you would, um, and I'll give you a chance. I'll take a break, Miss Nelson. I'll give you a chance to get through all of them, but that change should have been made by now on that one. Uh, I was saying that on the third paragraph, uh, the term that is used or that was used in the draft that we were working off of on Friday uh, states uh, or says state of mind, not culpable state of mind. I went ahead and just changed it to culpable mental state again just to be consistent throughout. So the only thing that I'm noticing is in there's a, a, a brief sentence with a colon that goes before the bullet points and it, it talks about the applicable states of mind. Oh, okay, I missed one then. Okay, give me just a second. Which paragraph is it? Well, technically, I think it would be the fourth, Your Honor. Oh, here it is, the, the applicable culpable mental states. Thank you for catching that, I'll change that. So is the court changing it to uh, applicable culpable mental states or mental states? Culpable mental states. And I think it makes sense to be consistent throughout. So any objection to that, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Any objection, Ms. Nelson? No, no objection, Your Honor. But I did notice that, um, and I know we talked about moving the, um, this instruction to come after the elemental instructions. Yes. Um, but then I also noticed that we still have the instruction that provides definitions for other words and phrases like deadly weapon, firearm, explosive, or incendiary device before the elementals. And so my request would be that we either do all of the defining of terms before or after. It just seems a little odd to me to define some of the terms that they're going to hear about in the elementals before, but then not, but then not define the couple of the mental states until after. Well, but the couple of the mental states, it's not just a definitional instruction. It's talking about the uh, state of the mental states that are elements of the offenses. So I think it makes sense to have that one come after the elemental instructions because otherwise they won't know why we're including reckless uh, in that instruction. In terms of the definitional instruction, um, it doesn't bother me to have it precede the elemental instructions. And in some ways I think it's helpful because when they see the terms come up in the, in the elemental instructions, and some of these terms will come up in the elemental instructions, they will already have a definition, but um, I'm not, um, I don't feel strongly about it one way or another. Do the people have a position, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Give me just a moment, Ms. Nelson. I don't have a problem moving it, Ms. Nelson, so if you prefer to have me move it, I'll move it to right after the elemental instructions. Actually, I think it makes sense to have the culpable mental states come immediately after the elemental instructions, so I'll move this one right after that. Is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. Next instruction that has any changes is let's see here.
is the uh, insanity instruction. And before that one, um, the theory of defense instruction has been included now. So let's talk about that one at the end, okay? So let's pass that one for now. So don't let me forget to talk about that one or, or to come back to that one. But the one that talks about the defense of insanity, um, I changed it at Ms. Nelson's request in page two, I think it's on page two, I should say. So now in the first full paragraph on that page, the second sentence reads, in order to meet this burden of proof, the prosecution must disprove beyond a reasonable doubt both of the above number conditions with respect to the act alleged in the charge offense in each count and in each of the lesser included offenses of that charge offense. And then I have deleted the last sentence that used to be there because I agreed with Ms. Nelson that that last sentence was repetitive, especially given the modification to the sentence that I just read. I, I um, considered whether to change above number conditions based on the objection that Mr. Orman had. And for a while there, I thought that we could say both of the number conditions stated earlier or listed earlier in this instruction. The problem with that is it makes it more wordy and then it makes it, I think, a little more difficult to follow. So I think it'll be clear what uh, both of the number conditions, above number conditions, refers to. So I ended up deciding that it was not unnecessary and that it made the instruction less clear as opposed to more clear. The next instruction that I changed is the very following instruction uh, that deals with the phrase incapable of distinguishing right from wrong as used in this instruction refers to a person's cognitive inability due to a mental disease or defect to distinguish right from wrong as measured by a societal standard of morality even though the person may be aware that the conduct in question is illegal. Uh, it used to read like that and now the change is that it, it says criminal instead of illegal. I did that because I went back and, and reread People versus Serravo, S-E-R-R-A-V-O, A23 Pacific 2nd, 128, Colorado Supreme Court, 1992, and also People versus Galamanis, 944 Pacific 2nd, 626, Colorado Court of Appeals, 1997, and Galamanis is spelled G-A-L-I-M-A-N-I-S. And after rereading the relevant portions of both cases, I uh, became convinced that I should stick with the language that those cases used and not my own language. And so I went ahead and changed that to criminal. That's, I understand, over the defense's objection, but I think it's the appropriate way to proceed. So that change I wanted to point out to you because we had not talked about it uh, on Friday. That's a change that I made on my own after going back and reviewing those cases. Uh, and just for the record, uh, Ms. Nelson, I, I understand that you object to the use of that particular term. Uh, I understand that your preference would be to use the word illegal, and initially I had agreed with you. But uh, setting that aside for a moment, you are asking that I give this particular instruction. Is that correct? And I ask because, as you know, that it, this instruction is not required. Uh, Mr. King requested it during the trial the people, I think, said that they didn't think it was necessary, but I went ahead and gave it based on the request by Mr. King. So I'm assuming you want this instruction, right? Yes, we do, Your Honor. And I just want to make sure that I constitutionalize our objection to the change under the 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution, as well as the uh, Article 2, Section 16, 20, 23, and 25 of the Colorado Constitution. Okay, thank you. All right, the next instruction that changed is the informational instruction. So that's the very next instruction. And again here, before we talk about the change, I want to make a record that the defense is asking me to give this particular instruction. Um, the uh, case law in Colorado, as I understand it, says that uh, upon request by the defendant, 
this is an instruction that I should give. And let me just uh, quote the actual language from People versus Thompson. That's T-H-O-M-S-O-N. T-H-O-M-S-O-N. 197 Colorado 232. 591 Pacific 2nd, 1031. Colorado 1979. That's a Colorado Supreme Court case. There, the court adopted the rule that a defendant who is relying on an insanity defense is entitled, upon request, to an instruction on commitment procedures. Um, and so when I, this weekend, did some research on this, and I read some of the cases that, that have cited and relied on Thompson, um, first of all, it is clear to me that the court simply wants to make sure that the jury is not um, misled or that the jury does not misunderstand uh, or does not speculate about what happens if the defendant is found not guilty by reason of insanity. And the court's rationale was, you know, most lay people understand what happens if someone is found not guilty in a criminal trial. They get that the person gets to walk out. They're acquitted. Most lay people also understand what happens if they are found guilty in a criminal trial. They understand that the court then has to impose punishment. But most lay people are not aware of what happens when someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity. And the court's, concerns, the court's concern is that uh, jurors may speculate, and as a result of speculating, there may be a miscarriage of justice. For example, if a juror thinks that a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict results in the defendant walking out of the courtroom, uh, the jury may be more inclined to find him guilty. And that's what the court is trying to address. And so the court said that if the defendant requests an instruction on commitment procedures, that the court should give the instruction. It is clear to me that the court was not envisioning having the trial judge give uh, a law school lecture on what happens in case someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity, but rather a brief statement uh, related to commitment procedures, related to what happens in the event that there's a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. But then I went and looked at the statutes to make sure that um, we were being accurate. And a couple of things. Number one, um, based on Section 16.8-105.5. Subsection 4. I added the word custody. Uh, and I know that the, the, the defense had made a request wanting to convey to the jury that this isn't just a regular hospital, but that the person is being held uh, in some sort of, sort of custodial type of arrangement. And I had denied that. I don't know whether the defense had actually used the word custody, but if you look at subsection 4, what the law says is that if the trier of fact finds the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity, the court shall commit the defendant to the custody of the Department of Human Services until such time as a defendant is found eligible for release. And then he goes from there to talk about more details, and I know that the defense had included some of these details in one of the tendered instructions that they submitted. Uh, and it talks about the executive director of the Department of Human Services uh, shall designate the state facility at which the defendant shall be held for care and psychiatric treatment and may transfer the defendant from one facility to another if, in the opinion of the director, it is desirable to do so in the interest of the proper care, custody, and treatment of the defendant, or the protection of the public, or the personnel of the facilities in question. And, you know, the, the question that comes to mind is, how much detail is appropriate? And if I give this, then there may be other detail that some a party may want, and there may be other detail that then I can possibly give as well. And I don't think that the idea is to give as much detail as possible. The idea, as I understand the case law, 
is to provide a, a brief statement about what happens in the event that the, the jury finds the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity. But in any event, I added the word custody, uh, which wasn't in, in the instruction before. Additionally, uh, I modified the language in the instruction based on what I believe is the applicable, applicable test for release. And counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I looked at Colorado Revised Statute Section 16-8-120, which is titled Applicable Test for Release. So subsection 1 applies to any person charged with any crime allegedly com committed on or after June 2, 1965. Uh, subsection 2 applies to any person charged with any crime allegedly committed prior to June 2, 1965. So certainly subsection 2 has no application here. Subsection 3 applies to any person charged with any crime allegedly committed on or after July 1, 1983. And then subsection 4 applies to any person charged with any crime allegedly committed on or after July 1, 1983, but before July 1, 1995, that resulted in commitment by reason of impair, impair mental condition. So 4 doesn't apply either. And so the two possibilities are subsection 1 and subsection 3. It seems to me that um, because this is a case that relates to a person charged with a crime allegedly committed on or after July 1, 1983, subsection 3 should apply. And so I have used the language in terms of the test for eligibility that appears in subsection 3. And it reads as follows. It says, as to any person charged with any crime allegedly committed on or after July 1, 1983, the test for determination of a defendant's sanity for release from commitment or his eligibility for conditional release shall be that the defendant has no abnormal mental condition which would be likely to cause him to be dangerous either to himself or others or to the community in the reasonably foreseeable future and is capable of distinguishing right from wrong and has substantial capacity to conform his conduct to requirements of law. So that's what ha that language is now reflected in the instruction with one exception. I took out the reference to sanity because I don't want to confuse the jury. I don't want the jury being confused between what the test for sanity is in this trial and what the test for sanity would be in the event that um, we are dealing with eligibility for release after a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict. So that's, that explains the changes to, um, to this instruction. One other change that I made to this instruction is that I deleted the reference to Arapahoe County District Court. Uh, I felt that it was clearer to make the instruction, at least part of it, personal to the defendant or individualize it to this case and therefore just left the court um, as opposed to talking about just a defendant, at least in that beginning of the second full paragraph of the instruction. I think that um, Uh, the last sentence of that second paragraph, it is okay there to talk about general terms because I think there is just setting forth what the test is. But I think the first sentence is informing the jury what happens if this defendant is found not guilty by reason of insanity. So that's why I changed it and, and it, it, it appears the way it is. Um, given my change to make it individualized or to make it apply to this case, it didn't make sense to leave the Arapahoe County District Court in there. Uh, the last thing I have is that the language that used to be in this instruction, which I know came from the case law, it, it came from Thompson. You know, in Thompson, the court didn't say, here's the language that, I, that we think the trial courts uh, should use uh, when giving this informational instruction. What happened in that case, 
as you folks may remember, is that the trial court had used an informational instruction and the court had to pass judgment as to whether that instruction by the trial court was appropriate or not. And the court said, yes, it was appropriate, and it was a good thing that the trial court gave it. And then the court said, in addition, it should be preceded by um, a, a sentence that says, this is an informational instruction and must have no persuasive bearing on the verdict that you arrive at under the evidence. And so that line has been added. But I don't know that, uh, as a trial court, we're glued to the specific language in the instruction that was before the court in Thompson. And I think we have to be, uh, it seems to me, we have to be consistent with the law in Colorado today in terms of the test that applies for eligibility, eligibility for release. And I think the language that used to be in here before comes from, uh, as far as I can tell, Colorado Revised Statute Section 16-8-115, subsection 1. But what that statute talks about is when the Department of Corrections submits a report to the court uh, related to eligibility for release, not the test applicable for eligibility to be released. The test applicable for eligibility to be released is articulated in the, in the statute that I cited, 16-8-120 subsection 3. So, all right, having said all that, um, I don't know if you want a chance to um, uh, be heard further, heard further on this or not. Do the people have anything else on this instruction, Mr. Orman? We agree with the instruction, Your Honor. Okay. Does the defense have anything else on this instruction, Ms. Nelson? I would like the chance to review this in a little bit more detail if the court would allow us to do so at a break just so that we can compare the language with the language that, that we submitted in the statute. I, I just didn't have it. I didn't just I didn't get to this one before the court took the bench. You bet. I'll, I'll, give, I'll take a break and I'll give you a chance to do that. Thank you, Your Honor. The last instruction that changed that I wanted to talk to you about is the last instruction in the draft. And this one changed based on Ms. Nelson's request. In one way, based on Ms. Nelson's request. In another, based on Mr. Orman's request. Uh, the, the first change that I wanted to point out to you is on the first line. Instead of saying following the party's closing arguments, I think it's more appropriate to say following the attorney's closing arguments. And so I've changed it that way. Uh, but the next change, or the next changes come on the second page. You'll see that in the second full paragraph, now it reads as follows. I, as mentioned earlier in these instructions, each count charges a separate and distinct offense, and the evidence and the law applicable to each count should be considered separately and influenced by your decision as to any other count. Therefore, the fact that you may find the defendant guilty of the charge offense or a lesser included offense in a count should not control your verdict as to the charge offense and lesser included offenses in any other count. Similarly, the fact that you may find the defendant not guilty of the charge offense and the lesser included offenses in a count should not control your verdict as to the charge offense and the lesser included offenses in any other count. This is the case even if the reason that you find the defendant not guilty of the charge offense and the lesser included offenses in account is solely based on the prosecution's failure to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was sane at the time of the commission of the act. Having said that, if you find the defendant guilty of any charge offense or lesser included offense in any count, you should disregard Part B of all the verdict forms. You should answer the verdict question in Part B of the verdict forms only if you find the defendant not guilty of all the charge offenses and all the lesser included offenses in this case. The verdict question in Part B of each verdict form asks whether the jury found the defendant not guilty of the charge offense and the lesser included offenses solely based on the defense of insanity. Pursuant to these instructions, you will either complete Part B of all the verdict forms or you will disregard Part B of all the verdict forms. So that paragraph that starts with us mentioned earlier in these instructions was added at Ms. Nelson's request to make sure it is clear that the jury understands that uh, their verdict on one count 
um, does not uh, bind or affect, influence the, the, the verdict on, on a separate count. Um, then the changes in the following paragraph in terms of underlining and, and, and making it a bold font for certain words was based on Mr. Orman's request. I didn't think it was necessary on Friday, but given that I'm adding this other paragraph, I felt that it was necessary to make sure they understand that they are not to uh, concern themselves with Part B of any of the verdict forms unless they find the defendant guilty of all the charge offenses, excuse me, unless they find the defendant not guilty of all the charge offenses and all the lesser included offenses. I think that given the paragraph that I added at Ms. Nelson's request, I think it is appropriate and necessary to highlight for them or to emphasize for them the only time when they fill out the um, Part B of all the verdict forms. Uh, and then I added the par parenthetical in that last paragraph that I read, based again on Ms. Nelson's request, uh, to make sure the jury understands what Part B of the verdict forms relates to. And then to be consistent, I did the same two paragraphs later with respect to Part C of each verdict form. I added a parenthetical. Now, I know, Ms. Nelson, you haven't had a chance to review it, so during the break, I'll give you a chance to do that, okay? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And I just wanted to make sure, um, I agree that we, we did have some discussion about um, making some clarifications and additions to this instruction. I also just wanted to confirm that the court did receive the pleading that I filed with, after court on Friday, I concluded that I needed to give the court some more specific language, and so I did submit proposed revisions of my own this morning in D-292. Yeah, and I, uh, D-291 or D-292? I have D-291 in front of me. D-292. 291 was just the resubmission of all the original charges as well as the supplemental instructions um, with numbers. But D-292, which I also, I emailed to um, your staff and the prosecution last night, contained um, actual proposed revision to the, um, proposed specific proposed revisions to a number of the instructions that reference the verdict forms. I, I haven't seen it. I've, I have D-291 in front of me. I, I don't know what D-292 says. And frankly, I was going to get to this, but D-291 is stricken as improperly filed. What I said you could do is you could renumber your tendered instructions. I didn't say that you could file um, a pleading that contains argument and record. Uh, so this is stricken. If you want to refile the instructions uh, that you have tendered by numbering them, uh, you can do that. I've given you leave to do that. If you want to make a record with respect to anything else, you have to make it here in court. So uh, this is stricken, and I'll issue an order striking it. Uh, what, we'll, what we're going to do is we'll take a break, and I'll give you a chance to figure out what oral record you want to make uh, in terms of what was in this improperly filed pleading. And I'll give the people an opportunity to respond, and then I'll rule on any request that you have, okay? All right, is there anything else before I take a break uh, with respect to the instructions? Your Honor, not with respect to the instructions. At some point, I would like to approach the bench to make a record about a sensitive victim issue whenever that would be accommodating for the court things. All right, first I want to finish the, uh, talking about the instructions. Oh, the theory of defense instruction. I'll give Ms. Nelson a chance to review it. Uh, but uh, the record should reflect that pursuant to the law, I took the instruction that was tendered by the defense, which I concluded was improper, uh, and uh, that's because it sounded more like closing argument than a theory of defense instruction. I did my best to capture the essence of the theory of defense instruction, and I have redrafted it then and included it in the set that I gave the parties. I'll give you a chance to review it, and then Ms. Nelson, you can tell me if you would like me to modify anything without waiving your tendered instruction, um, if, you would, if you have any objections to any uh, words that I've used, I've tried to use the words that you used other than um, to make it clear that these are the assertions of the defendant and not statements by the court. Uh, uh, those words that reflect that aspect of the um, theory of defense instruction that I drafted are my words. For example, the defendant uh, asserts or claims, or contends, or averse. Uh, those are my words, and I, I've tried to um, be clear that these are the defendant's assertions. If you want me to change some of those words, uh, let me know, and I'll happily change them. Um, as, you know, I've tried to vary it so it's not repetitive, so we're not saying asserts, 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 over and over and over again, but 
If you would prefer to just do a search over and over, I'll do that. If you have any particular objection to anything uh, that, that I left out that you think relates to the essence of the theory of defense and it's not argument, then you can tell me that. If you would like me to modify anything uh, or add anything, you can tell me that. If you would like me to take something out, you can tell me that. But this is my best effort uh, as to what an appropriate theory of defense instruction uh, should look like, given what uh, the tender uh, theory of defense instruction contained. So we'll take a break. I'll give you a chance to do that, and then we'll proceed. Mr. Orman. Just one question, Your Honor, regarding the verdict forms. You've yes. given us these sample verdict forms, and we've checked them, and there doesn't seem to be any issues with them. Uh, at some point, though, I think we're going to need to get all of the proposed verdict forms just so that we can check them, because I know the court would want us to do that. And I was just wondering if there's a plan for that. We, we will. My staff will... E we'll email them to you, but I don't know when that's going to be. That's going to take a lot of time. I, we ca I can't do that unless we finalize everything first. And so I want to make sure everything is finalized. And then, you know, uh, given that it's 165 of them, uh, we better make sure that they are final. So, and we'll email them to both sides. I know that uh, the parties had asked, and I think specifically the people, for an email version of the latest draft. And I will give you that. Keep in mind that this will not have the blanks filled in uh, because if you want the ones that show the blanks filled in then we'll have to scan those and uh, it sounded like you didn't want them scanned you wanted them on Word so if you don't care about the blanks being left empty then that's what you both will get uh, and then you'll get the final copies tomorrow when you get here with all the numbers filled in thank you your honor that, that makes a lot of sense okay alright we'll take a break that'll give Miss Nelson a chance to review some of the uh, things that I have talked about, and then we'll proceed. The court will be in recess. Thank you. Your Honor, how long yes. are we taking? How long do you need? Half hour, 45 minutes? Fine, whatever okay? you need. Okay, and would the court like, I, I was not aware that the court had not received um, the proposed, my proposed revisions in DT92. Would, I have a copy of them if the court would like to see them. Well, uh, which, ones are, which ones have been revised? Um, the, the proposed revisions, if the court recalls as we were going through the instructions, I kept right. saying that I had objections to um, the, element, the part of the elemental instruction that referenced the verdict form. And so I, there are um, proposed revisions, fairly short revisions to each of the elemental instructions as well as to the instructions that discuss the verdict forms. So. I don't, you know, I don't, I think you've made your record. I mean, my concern is I will not have time to review these instructions. We're talking about instructions now. You've had plenty of time to submit them. These are late. If you want, you know, you've made your record as to what your objection is. Uh, if you want to, I'm not sure what exactly these have that you haven't made a record on already. It's very specific language, Your Honor. And, and I felt after the instruction conference, I made a general argument about the problems that I see with the verdict forms. And I asked the court, generally speaking, the court kept saying, you know, remind me, you know, it's on you to remind me to go back to these particular instructions. And I didn't propose word for word specific language um, that I was requesting be changed or added to the elementals. And so after Friday's conference, I spent the weekend thinking about it and decided that in order to provide Mr. Holmes with effective assistance of counsel, I needed to make sure that I made it abundantly clear to the court exactly what I was asking from the court. Obviously, we had the charging conference on Friday, and it's now Monday morning, so that's why I took the liberty of emailing uh, an advance copy of this pleading to the court staff as well as the prosecution last night, and I had our paralegal file it with the court at 8.30 this morning. So, well, What we'll do is we'll go through them one by one, and you can tell me what you've modified, and then I'll consider it, and we'll go from there, okay? Okay. All right, the court will be in recess. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a time that the court would like me to come back to address issues with regard to scheduling for penalty and our motion under uh, Colorado Rules of Criminal Procedure? Whenever we're done with the instructions. I want to get the instructions done first. So that's up to, mostly up to Ms. Nelson. I don't know how long it's going to take her. And then I don't know how long it's going to take us after that. So it's hard to say. So we'll do the best we can. Okay. The court will be in recess. Thank you. Please rise.